wonderful welcome to everyone. Good evening. This is Koshulia UK Women Empowerment's event for June. And a bit about myself. I am Koshulia UK's volunteer host for Women Empowerment event and the other monthly event, the mixed event, Men Are From Mars, where we have two male and two female speakers. So a bit about Koshulia UK. It is a not-for-profit community organization to empower and uplift women. And the founder is here with us, Ritu Sharma, who's a dear friend and an amazing, has an amazing heart for helping women who are on a journey to find fulfillment and raise awareness of issues that affect women. So projects for Koshulia UK include personal and professional growth, health and well-being, financial education and entrepreneurship, workshops, so if um, our speakers would like to do a one hour, 45 minutes to one hour workshop, there's another volunteer, Zina Kula, who coordinates these. So let me know. And of course, social events. We have a social media presence, which includes a WhatsApp chat group, Facebook page, and of course, the Koshulia UK website and YouTube channel. I don't think I've missed anything out. <laughs> so wonderful to have our speakers here. Darina, I'm going in the order on my screen. Darina Lanza, joining us from Palm Beach, Florida, in the US of A. We have Ava joining us from London and Janet joining us from Chesant, uh, also in the UK. Um, so we are privileged to have you speak this evening and so very much looking forward to that. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to say big thank you for this platform. Thank you, Ritu, um, for creating this to really fill a need and a gap where this is a platform where the speakers can be unashamedly them. And, oh, one sec, unashamedly them. The events are recorded and will be posted to the Koshulia UK um, website and also on the YouTube channel as well. It is being recorded. The speakers can um, edit down just their section and post on their social media platforms also. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our very first speaker for the evening, who is Ava N. James. So Ava is an author, motivational speaker and resilience performance coach and beautiful as well, if I may say so, Ava. Thank you. <laughs> With a background in mental health law, leadership, management and administration, her career expands over several industries, including healthcare and insurance. Leveraging her own setbacks and disappointments, she has found her unique power of resilience and views every day as an opportunity to cultivate a culture of compassion and inspiration. She is passionate about helping her clients succeed in their high achieving roles to create more energy and resilience with practical strategies and tools on emotional intelligence, mindfulness skills, and slowing down without sacrificing their health and well-being. When Ava is not speaking, Ava can be found writing with several publications to date, networking and playing the piano. Woohoo, Ava, over to you. Thank you so much, Carol, for inviting me to this event. And I also look forward to listening to the inspiring journeys of all the other women this evening. So good evening, ladies. In the next 20 minutes, I think my aim is to inspire and stimulate you with hope. So let's dive right in. So to begin with, I have a few questions. What if you found out you were going to die tomorrow? Would you be worried about the things that bog you down today? What if I told you not to get stuck in yesterday or wait until tomorrow when things get better and you have 
more success, more friends, more money, but be present in the moment, would you do that? Better still, would you tell yourself that? So today I'm starting with a snapshot of my story. I never thought I'd learn how to appreciate what I do from losing a job I loved. The lesson didn't hit me until years later. To be honest, who wants to hear the words, we've made a decision to close the office and we're making you redundant. I never thought I'd learn more about marriage and the sacredness of wedding vows through divorce, understanding that happily ever after can change in an instance. It took me years to rebuild my confidence and fathom the sacrifice and commitment that's necessary to walk down the aisle and say I do. I never thought I'd learn about being brave when you wake up to news you never thought you'd hear anyone say to you, it's over, not once, but enough times to think, can it get any worse? Will I ever be happy? I learned more about happiness through heartbreak, abuse and rejection, leaving me with zero self-belief because I kept knocking on the wrong door, expecting the right one to open. I kept hearing the word no when all I wanted it to be was yes. Then there's that call that we dread most. The doctor reports the news of the big C, cancer, and you watch loved one after loved one lose their battle. I never thought I'd learn more about the preciousness of life through death. When someone you love so deeply departs and you never get to say goodbye. Those who know me really well will tell you that I love asking questions because I believe through questioning the world we live in, we find beauty when our dreams, hopes, and plans feel like ashes. So I ask this question to you. Why do we believe our problems are permanent when our life on this planet is temporary? I have the power to stop the narrative, to stop the patterns, to stop the self-limitations, to stop the same old story, staying stuck, doing the same thing, but expecting different results. The power really is in your hands. If I had to ask you to raise your hand and tell me today, in this room, has anyone lived through a job loss? financial losses, heartbreak, miscarriage, divorce, watching someone you love slowly slip away to dementia, battle with cancer until it wins, or helplessly staring as they die of a broken heart. Would you say, yes, I've been through my own adversity? You see, becoming brave and beautiful is my story. Because I learned that resilience is the ability to adapt from negative change. When things are going well in our lives, we don't need someone to help us. I didn't learn how to bounce back stronger when things were going great. I didn't learn how to build my faith until I found myself alone and uncertain of what the future would be. I didn't gain confidence until my self-esteem was crushed into zillions of pieces. It was in those long, dark nights where I sobbed through my heartbreak, writing and asking questions and praying. It was in the wilderness and the desert places where there was no one, just me and my journal. I learned more from rejection without explanation, to let go and find closure, accept redirection through reflection as a blessing, not a disappointment. I took the setbacks and used them as a stepping stone to build and grow, evolve and elevate. So I believe everything happens for a reason and rejection is simply a redirection to a different pathway. 
an avenue that can lead us to a higher level. There I chose to grow through my pain. There I pushed until the dawn broke through and I refused to be the smoldering wick that could be snuffed out. It was the change in circumstances that had to happen for me to learn this. It wasn't when life was smooth sailing that my character was chiseled, but through bearing every affliction with grace. So why am I here today? To tell you that we all have the power to let go of what once felt familiar and manage fear to open the biggest room in the world, the room for improvement. We can all break free from our established paths, even if sometimes it means you're pushed into the unknown. There the adventure begins to explore and reinvent ourselves so that you break the mold and survive your struggle to emerge like that beautiful butterfly. Sometimes we have to tell ourselves something different to what we keep thinking, to change the situation by building our power to be better than we were yesterday and to keep growing because every day is a school day and there's always going to be a lesson to learn from every experience we go through, whether it's adversity or tragedy, loss or broken dreams that we sustain. So today I have three things that I would like to share with you. The first one is change the way you look at things and the things you look at change. I realize that not everyone in my life would be a puzzle piece that would fit into my life. I couldn't force what isn't meant to be to become a part of my life because not everyone is meant to be a part of our destiny. But every lesson we learn is valuable because no experience is ever wasted and we gain wisdom from living life looking forwards and understand life by looking backwards. Everything is a valuable part of our stories, who we become, how we respond, what we do to what happens with us so that we grasp the importance to recognize what is meant for us and what isn't. So will you react or will you respond to situations? Because everybody wants to be a somebody. There's no one, none of us, who doesn't desire to be someone or have a life of significance. But no one really cares about how much we know until they know how much we care. I believe it's all about heart-centered leadership and loving people from our hearts. I'm passionate about the significance resilience plays in our life journey because it's not if, but when. We all gonna get our hearts broken. We might not all experience something like divorce, but one day, Death will part us from the ones that we love dearest. There'll be challenges, cancer, maybe dementia, terminal illness or tragedy. What counts is how we respond. So it's not our reaction because that will always be entrenched with emotion. But our responses are filled with choices. Despite our pain, despite the brokenness, to cultivate our hope, to grow stronger, so that next time we gain the bounce back ability to persevere, rise, and thrive. So when you're nervous about stepping outside of your comfort zone, remind yourself that even though the situation that you might be grappling with feels really scary because it's unfamiliar, you are more than capable 
of coping with the challenge. Then go into number two, which is choose a growth mindset to be better than you were yesterday. It's all about learning the lessons from what actually happens to us so that we can rinse and repeat the strategies and tools that we gain to cope with setbacks. And what does that mean? I think it means grow through our pain and grow with hope. Because growing up doesn't end when we become adults. Continual growth throughout our lives helps us to accept events, but then choose a response for a different outcome. So I'll go back to that question that I asked a bit earlier. Why am I here today? There's no disappointment that can become greater than my own strength. I can share with you every disappointment I withstood. But if I hadn't persevered and pushed forward, I wouldn't be able to share with you how I acquired my strengths by getting back up again and again after every fall. I believe our values can lead us to our strengths, strength to hold on and become confident, strength to never take anything for granted, strength to become grateful. Strength to be mindful of today and look to tomorrow with faith, expectation, and hope. Strength to focus our energy on the good in our lives because we all have scars. What we don't all have is the braveness to turn our suffering into our biggest strengths. So, what will you decide to focus on? Because what we focus on becomes powerful in our lives. I daily make choices to focus on happiness, focus on peace, focus on hope, focus on faith over fear, focus on positivity, because this gives us the key to open doors to a meaningful life. Feedback that we get in life is motivating, but self-evaluation helps us to find our purpose. So every morning as I tackle my tasks and responsibilities, whether these be new or mundane, I ask myself this question, who am I going to be today? When we find out our why and do everything with purpose, life becomes more fun and we feel more alive. So if you're still searching for your purpose, this question might help. What would you do if you had all the time and money in the world? I love this quote. If you can't figure out your purpose, figure out your passion, for your passion will lead you right into your purpose. And so number three is find something greater than yourself. I'm no victim to my circumstances. That's my history. What I am is a victor because I flipped the script, didn't let anything different find who I am, or let circumstances determine how I respond. It's all about perspective. Will you see yourself as a victor where there seems to be another, when there seems to be another detour in your life or your plans? Will you see yourself as a victor when life shifts, bring you another difficulty and push you to the brink? And use endurance and encouragement when the going gets tough and it will to be strong and steadfast because that mountain that feels like it could crush you is actually going to make you stalwart in statue or unwavering as you prepare for greatness and expand your capabilities. So I march into every day with hashtag faith to move mountains and I pray for the wisdom to turn setbacks into comebacks. And I encourage you to keep pushing through from mindful to mindful. You see, there are many lessons that change can teach us, but clasping every last moment mindfully allows us to keep persevering and become brave and beautiful in every season of our lives because you matter. You are unique and you add value to the world. 
So I found my purpose. I found what makes my heart sing. And although I might not always be able to go back and change the beginning, I can start where I am and change the ending. Five years ago, in the most gorgeous month of the year, on a hot summer's day in June, I said yes to the most wonderful man in Paris, the city of love. And three years this September, we said I do. I wholeheartedly learned more through my trials, tests, and brokenness than I could have if my life had been a bed of roses. I wouldn't be able to reach and help women now who have experienced brokenness and loss, relate to their vulnerability, and inspire them to expand their self-worth if I hadn't lived through the rubble and devastation of my own setbacks to heal my hurts and build something beautiful from test to triumph. I wouldn't appreciate everything if I hadn't navigated loss with a gracious and courageous heart. And so now I feel like doors of abundance and blessing flow because I never gave up hope to be better than I was yesterday. It was in that hallway, those dark hallways of life's crushing and pressing that I discovered untapped potential truth in life. So in closing, I challenge you to break the cycle. You have the power to influence your life starting with how you think and find your way to emotional freedom and bounce back ability. Be the change you long to see because if not now, then when? As women, we are all part of a worldwide quilt. Each of us has a unique story woven together where we share, have a shared narrative. We have different ethnic intersections, unique experiences, and countless ranges of influence. My story is one of redemption and grace, and that's what I share in my writings. We don't have to be perfect or have it all figured out. We just need to step into our authenticity, vulnerability, and continue to grow, knowing that what we do can inspire and support someone else and create a ripple effect of positive change. So I'm a work in progress towards that masterpiece and a catalyst for growth. And I want you, women of worth, to believe that you are worthy, capable, and deserving of making a difference today. Absolutely. <laughs> what an opening. What an opening, Ava. <laughs> Thank you. You certainly brought value this evening. And you speak to many aspects of life. And you've been through a lot of them yourself. And um, I applaud you. Thank you. You don't know how much has been resonated this evening. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you. wow, you're one minute ahead. <laughs> oh, am I? <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Thank you, Ava. Um, thank you. Now I'd like to introduce you to our second speaker for the evening. The lovely and beautiful... Darina Lanza, joining us from Palm Beach, Florida. Darina is a distinguished advisor to elite entrepreneurs, known for inspiring teams to extraordinary performance. With a vast experience in the international luxury sectors, she's guided clients to billions in revenue increases, in revenue increases, and is recognized among the top 25 global trainers, previously an astronautical engineer whoa, and a medical physicist. She brings a unique blend of academic and business expertise. Join us as Darina offers her profound insights to transform your business journey. I am excited, Darina. So I yield the floor to you. Well, I have to tell you, Ava is certainly a hard act to follow. I don't know. 
<laughs> anyway, uh, probably the most useful thing for me to talk about uh, or to tell you the story about is kind of how I got to be where I am. I really uh, work with people who are already there, if you will, who are dissatisfied. They know there's something more, but they can't figure out quite how to get there. They have all the money in the world, but they're still miserable. Uh, you know, their wife hates them, although I work with mostly women. Um, their kids don't respect them. Uh, everything's, nothing is going well, except they've got plenty of money. But that doesn't quite do the trick. So uh, they wind up landing with me. And yes, we work on their business. But the issue primarily is uh, working on them to get them to become the person they need to be in order to get what they want. And it took me many, many, many decades, I should add a few more manys, uh, to figure this out. And, uh, you know, I'll give you a little bit of a brief history. Um, I was born in Italy. Uh, abandoned by my parents at nine months. They came to the United States, left me with my grandmother. My father came to be the chief uh, theoretician for the Harvard Cyclotron. My mother figured he can't go to the US by himself, so I, I'm gonna come too. And they left me there because the US government in their infinite wisdom refused to grant a nine month old a visa. So there you go. That was the beginning of my causing trouble. <laughs> anyway. Um, a couple of years later, I got, uh, I came to the U.S. My grandmother brought me here and uh, I, you know, grew up in, uh, you know, upper middle class circumstances outside of Boston, went to school. They took speech lessons to get rid of my Italian accent. And I began to question things. I began to question things in elementary school, for instance. I don't know, I was seven or eight. And I, I learned that there were these things called molecules that were made up of atoms. And these atoms were made up of these nucleus, you know, a nucleus and then these electrons flitting around and they were mostly empty space. And I couldn't figure out if that's the case, this wall is empty space, I'm empty space. Why can't I not walk through the wall? Why do I bounce off? So we've got a couple of parallel uh, stories going here. There's the issue of why can't I walk through a wall? And I can explain you, to you why, uh, if we have enough time. Uh, but then on the other hand, when I was a little kid, I learned that in order to get what I want, I had to become a master. There's something called mind types. There are seven of them. There's the giver and there's the, the, the perfectionist and the rebel. Anyway, I won't take you through it, but I'm the master. And I learned as a small a little kid that in order to get the attention that I wanted, I need to be needed to be unbelievable at everything that I did. Because if I didn't do that, I would not get whatever it was that I wanted when I was three years old or two years old. So that led to my having a string of what appeared to be successes. Um, I did everything very early. I, at 13, I was a ski instructor and I was the only one that could take people who were, you know, 97% of the way there to perfection. I also raced. Nobody else could teach the stuff. And that was really the first instance of my being able to get people to peak performance. Okay, fine. Uh, that was good. Eventually, I don't know, I guess the older people were complaining that I was getting all the high level classes. So I stopped getting so many of the high level students and I eventually stopped that. I went to college early, graduated early, became a professor at uh, the university, first in the math department, then in the business school when I was 19. And again, I excelled at taking uh, at, I couldn't do the, the basic courses, I, I, but I could get people to do really well in the high level courses because somehow I developed a knack to get people, and I'll tell you how that happened in a couple of minutes, uh, get people to go, 
oh, is that all that is? That's not hard. That's easy. I can do that. That's, that's a key. I then went on, became a medical physicist in the radiation oncology department treating cancer patients and uh, published some papers, uh, rudimentary research on three-dimensional treatment planning, which are being still, still cited today. Uh, also fa uh, research faculty at the Brown Medical School. And um, that was fine. But then I got the opportunity to become a rocket scientist at uh, MIT Draper Lab. So I did advanced inertial navigation systems. I won't bore you with the de details, but the things managed to hit their targets every time when they were actually used <laughs> later on. But I always wanted to make money because that was another value that was instilled with me. How much money do you make was the most important thing, my father would always ask. And so I went and I did my MBA and became a management consultant. It was during that relatively short period, I don't know, eight or nine years, that I wound up increasing client revenues by over $2 billion, which is now, that was, it was it's a lot more now than it was back then. I then wound up going into mergers and acquisitions, getting to the top of that. Then my daughter was born and I needed to make money and had the unfortunate experience of my ex-husband not being, ex-husband ex not being very supportive. So um, I wound up in the network marketing industry and built an organization of some 50,000 people. And it was at that point that I began to learn about the personal development, applying, at really understanding what I had been doing to get people to perform at levels they never thought possible instinctively. I finally began to learn some of the science, philosophy, psychology, whatever, whatever other field is included, that it, uh, you need to integrate in order to help people get to that peak state, whether it's in performance and skiing or, or racing. And by the way, we applied this when I used to race uh, skiing. We, we memorized the course and we practiced vis visualizing skiing down the course. And something that I'm sure you know is that if you imagine something vividly, your mind can't tell the difference between the actual experience and that imagination. So that's also been a thread. But anyway, back to the network marketing thing. It was at that point that I really understood that you can't just give people a bunch of instructions, you know, do this, 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 and this, and expect to do well. I realized at that point that you really need to become the person you need to be that will allow you to get what it is that you want. Of course, back then I hadn't figured out how to teach that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, you know, time continued. How am I doing on time? Speaking of which, I guess I'm talking fast. I'm only 10 minutes in, so we're good. We're good. Um, anyway, it's how I really immersed myself in this whole business about how really do you duplicate that peak performance thing uh, that some people are able to do and other people are not able to do until you kind of go, no, 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 over here, <laughs> over this way. And, and this, is what, this is what you wanna do. Long story short, I wound up becoming certified in all kinds of stuff, you know, whether it's, it's you know, the Reiki master, which I'd forgotten about until the other day. I'm like, oh, really? Um, hypnosis, NLP, timeline therapy. Uh, and I really got into the physics of consciousness, if you will. Everybody's running around going, oh, quantum physics, quantum physics. Well, most people are, that are running around saying quantum physics, first of all, it's quantum mechanics. It's not quantum physics. So don't ever say quantum physics because that's not a thing. <laughs> and everybody will know that you don't know what you're talking. No, they not everybody, but the people that know what they're talking about are going to know you don't. Anyway, it's quantum mechanics. And I, I have gotten into the whole issue of consciousness and the nature of reality and how we how we create things and 
I'm kind of jumping around here a little bit, but I wanted to make sure I didn't forget ab about this whole thing. Um, consciousness creates this world. That's why it happens to be just perfect for our 3D incarnation. We really are everything that is, has been, and ever can be having a temporary experience as Dorina Lanza, you know, doing whatever she's doing here temporarily. And my latest focus has been working with people to get them to internalize that they are not what they think they are, okay? What you see is not all there is. What you see, I'm in, a, I'm in a room and, you know, I got a lamp and I got a computer and there's a globe over there and a bunch of artwork I still have to hang. We just moved. Um, and it looks like there's empty space. Well, guess what? It turns out that the electromagnetic spectrum is 0.004% of everything that exists in three dimensions. Let's not get into higher dimensions. In three dimensions. And guess what? we can just see a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of the electromagnetic spectrum. So don't you tell me that you can see everything that there is. And when people hear that, they go, oh, is that true? They may go, you know, they'll, they'll ask for more explanation. We don't have time to get into it. I'm putting together a lecture series on this whole thing about, you know, what we can see, what we can't see, the whole issue of things do not become solid until they're observed by a conscious observer, whether it's a human or a cat or a lizard or whatever it is, as long as there's some kind of consciousness, that's when something becomes solid and it happens individually and it also happens collectively. Otherwise, it's a blur. It's waves, and that was proved over a hundred years ago. Um, and uh, now we're just, well, now people are coming out, people like me are beginning to come out to really teach people what the real nature of reality is. And when you look at that, there are a few components that, uh, that you wanna consider. There's you, well, you, <laughs> you and 3D. 3D five cents you, how's that? And you have a mind, the mind exists outside of you. Everything that you perceive, that you can touch, see, hear, feel, taste, et cetera, exists in your mind. Then you have the unconscious mind where you have, uh, that you can manipulate using things like hypnosis and timeline therapy and affirmations and all. That's where most people are living as far as trying to get people to actually make a change in how they, how they um, experience this particular incarnation of in 3D. Um, <clears throat> But what you're really being run by, 97, 99, depends on which study you look at, 97 to 99% of what people do, think, expect, and so on is run by the unconscious mind. And all of those tools that are available, all the uh, NLPs and all that stuff work on the unconscious mind. But beyond that, you've got a super conscious mind, you've got your, your, your fundamental blueprint, your master blueprint of who you are that has the filters of all the crap that you've been fed from school and the news and you're not good enough and, uh, and we're gonna tell you what to do and all the garbage that you've been hearing since you were a tiny, tiny kid. And that's what causes you to perceive what you're perceiving here. You experience what you expect. Your perception creates reality and all of the news media, all of the education system, all of everything that you're fed is intentionally fed to you so that you forgot forget who you really are, and you believe that this is all there is, me here, this table, this iPhone, and after we're dead, nothing happens. 
and you got to do what we say and you're a useless piece of crap and that's it. No wonder people are so screwed up, right? <laughs> so anyway, um, so I guess got a couple of more minutes. I guess the point that I want to make, really two points, in order to experience what you want to experience here in this temporary 3D five senses existence that we have, the first thing that you, you must do is be that person that you will become when you have all that stuff. Let's pretend, let's pretend, I'm gonna use a ridiculous example, let, but let's pretend you wanna be a billionaire and you wanna have a Gulfstream and you wanna have a Bentley and you wanna have a 10 carat, no, 20, 50 carat diamond ring. You wanna have all this stuff and, and you know, travel in high level circles and blah, 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 blah. Are you gonna get there behaving and being the person that you are right now? Yeah, no, because if you were, you'd be there already. Right. So I, one thing that I find that's very useful that I teach my clients is envision where you want to get whatever it is. Maybe you want to just be left alone and live in a cabin in the mountains. I don't know, whatever it is. And then go and look, right? ask yourself, meditate on it. Let your unconscious tell you. What would I be thinking about? How would I look? How would I sound? What would I value? What would, be, what would I be seeing outside the window? You know, what would I have? What kind of people would I be hanging around with? What would be my perspective on life? What would be the chatter in my head? Most people have the chatter of, you can't do anything right, blah, 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 blah. Well, the successful people don't. They've got the chatter of, I'm amazing. I'm incredible. And uh, therefore they become that. Once you get that whole thing honed down, do everything you can to remind yourself in your head to behave as though you are already there. And when, when not if, that is your perception, the reality will appear. And another distinction I'd like to give you, and then I, I will stop. Um, I once read somewhere, I can't, I can't remember where it was, but some, somebody was making this point in a book and he said, yeah, this is so-and-so and he graduated number one in his class and he became a rocket scientist and he became a man, I don't remember the real story, so I'm kind of using mine, uh, management consultant and 50,000 downline is working with billionaires and da, 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 da. And then on the other hand, Guess what? Nobody has all highs, but what I just described is all the highs. They didn't talk about the lows. Yes, abandoned at birth, abandoned at two, two and a half years, uh, you know, uh, made fun of in school, massive depression, uh, divorce, failure in this business, failure in the next business, failure in the other business, another divorce. I'm inventing things now. This, is, this isn't me, but I'm just inventing things. And so many people, instead of focusing on their successes, they focus on all their failures. Why? Because their family keeps reminding them of them. I know my family used to always say, no, oh, you think you're so great. You know, you're useless because look at this, 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 and this, and completely ignoring the achievement, which is, you know, the nature of humanity. So you really must take control of your per perception uh, so that you can actually behave as though you're the person you need to be in order to get what you want. And also remember that you are everything that is, has been, and ever can be having a temporary experience here in these three dimensions, five senses, this particular incarnation. And I think I am out of time. I could keep going. I was a professor. I can talk forever. So. Oh, Serena, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, how wonderful. It's lovely hearing different people's journeys 
um, achievements. It really is. And I thank you for sharing with us. Um, oh my goodness, beautiful, 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 beautiful. Thank you. And now, um, as we don't have Sarah Johnson, I'm going to pass over to Janet Eferi, um, who potentially is our last speaker for today. And who is Janet Eferi? Well, <laughs> she lives in Chesant. She's, um, her sales experience started seven years in direct sales at Xerox followed by 17 years as group head of business development in a private college where she oversaw the sales and marketing strategy. She has experience in pharmaceuticals, local government, software and estate agency and primarily works with new struggling or demotivated sales teams. Um, based in Chesant in Hertfordshire and has written two sales books one of which is a number one bestseller on Amazon. Well, what more can I say, Janet? <laughs> Apart oh, from you. over to you. Oh, thank you so much. Is it possible I can um, screen share? Okay, how do I do that? I Oh yeah, share screen, cool. Thank you very much. All right, so what I'm gonna do, don't worry, it's not one of those uh, really long, uh, presentations. Um, okay, so thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I'm super happy to be here tonight. So um, yeah, I call myself a sales expert. Well, why do I do that? Um, well, I'm going to take you on my journey. And what I loved about what Darina said is I don't hide the bad stuff. Uh, you will find out I've had some really high highs and I've had some really low lows. And I want to share with you what that story looked like so uh, without further ado um, exactly as Carol said I started my sales career at Xerox um, why did I go into sales well I had a friend and he suddenly started turning up in a really nice car with really nice clothes and lots of money and I thought do you know what that that really appeals to me so I was very lucky I ended up in Xerox who are one of the premier sales organizations in the world the training is phenomenal we spent probably three weeks a year on training so for seven years I was in direct sales in Xerox and then I met my late husband this is he and I um, and what happened was uh, he had a tiny college in North London six students I joined him so I was in charge of business development um, recruiting a sales and marketing team motivating them managing them um, and really heading up the strategic sales and marketing piece, uh, whereas he was the academic. And what happened was over 17 years, we grew those six students to 650 students. We had a turnover of about three and a half million pounds, something like 35 staff. And it was great um, absolutely loved it and it was going super super well we actually had two colleges we had one called transatlantic college which dealt with business management uh, those sorts of subjects and my husband who was a fabulous strategic thinker and um, he realized that the hiv aids pandemic was particularly affecting sub-saharan africa so we created a second college called College of Venereal Disease Prevention. And we trained people with the most up-to-date information and then they go back to their locality and teach it to the local people in a way that they understood. So very good partnership. Um, this is us in Nigeria launching something called the British Education Network. And Darina, I hope you're impressed. While I was there, I had the opportunity to study at MIT Sloan. I did an accelerated MBA. And I sat next to an astronaut. That's the bit I really remember. It was so cool. So, um, yeah, it was going great. We were having a lovely time, had a super life. And then it didn't go so well. Because what happened was in the UK, the government changed all the rules on student visas. So most of our students were foreign students. And it meant that they had to get a visa to um, to come and study in the UK and there were lots of places that weren't doing it legitimately so false colleges and this had been rumbling on for several years but one day in 2012 
the UK government took our license away from us. So we couldn't run a college anymore. And literally within three months, we'd lost it all. We couldn't recruit new students. The existing students said, aha, you are going to close. We are not paying our fees. We lost all the staff, uh, the business closed. And this is where the trouble starts. So we lost our house. We lost our three rental properties. Uh, my husband, who is Nigerian by birth, went back to Nigeria to see if he could salvage some business there. So I'm in the UK. I'm homeless. I have two school aged children. I have no money. I have no job. And ultimately, I had to go bankrupt. And that's a bad place to be. When people say I'm broke, I don't think they actually understand what really broke is, as in I couldn't afford to uh, use the electricity, as in I couldn't afford food. And one Christmas I had to rely on food bank just to get us through it. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'm good at sales. I'll get a sales job. Quickest way I know to earn money is a nice commission only sales job. I don't need to be the manager. I just want to earn commission. But unfortunately, I've been out of sales too long and I, out of corporate too long and I, I didn't fit and I couldn't get a job. So I thought, OK, what can I do? Well, I can train, I can sell. So I decided to be a sales trainer. Now, this picture on the bottom right with the arrow, this is McDonald's in Enfield, North London. And when I said I was broke, I couldn't afford Internet at home. So what I used to do was I dropped the children off at school and I took my tatty old laptop and my sandwiches and every day for three months, I went to McDonald's and that arrow is where I sat in the corner out the way so that the customers couldn't see. It. I had my own sandwiches. The staff were fine with it because I made friends with the staff. And I created my company, which are called Tadpole Training, because my surname's really hard. I don't know if you if you look at it, you probably can't pronounce it, although you did a very good job, Carol. And um, you probably can't pronounce it. I bet you won't remember it and you probably can't spell it. So I thought I've got to have a memorable name. So I called my company Tadpole Training. Even if they called me the Tadpole Woman, at least they're remembering me. And I just grafted and it got better. So two years later, um, I twice went to the final of uh, this is the Association of Professional Coaches, Trainers and Consultants. So twice I reached their final as trainer of the year. Uh, this is a really good one. And um, I entered the Guardian's startup of the year. So the Guardian is a national paper in the UK. And I got to the final. Um, and if you Google me now, it's still one of the top things that comes up. So I'm super proud of that. Um, and then my institute, my institute is called the Institute of Sales and Marketing Management. And twice I got to the final of their sales trainer of the year. And they liked me so much that twice they invited me back to judge a category called telesales professional of the year. Um, but here's, here's one of my really good ones. I told you I came from Enfield. Well, I won Enfield's Startup Business of the Year. So this is me at the awards ceremony. So this was because I knew sales. It was all up here and that doesn't require money. But I knew there was a requirement for people who could train, who could teach, and particularly entrepreneurs, because entrepreneurs are often amazing at what they do. But no one's ever taught them sales. They get taught marketing, but they don't get taught sales. So although I started to train corporates, I really focused in on entrepreneurs and small business owners. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I got nominated for another award. So this is uh, Women in Training and Tuition, I think it is. So um, in the introduction, uh, Carol mentioned that I wrote a couple of books. Now, I did contribute to some academic books, so a book on management economics and financial principles, also a book on um, HIV and AIDS prevention, and I contributed to a book on STI prevention. But my sales books are these. So this one is called Small Business Sales Dilemmas. That got to number 28 on Amazon. And this is my number one best-selling book, which was a collaboration, and that's called Sales Genius 2. So what is my why? Well, my why is, is these guys. So here's my son, Ben, and my daughter, Olivia, and my mum in the middle. And this is her place in Lincolnshire. And that's kind of what kept me going, really. And I do still have ambition. I'm sure some of you watch TED Talks. Um, so I have an ambition to do a TED Talk on why wearing the right knickers will help you sell more. I'm sure it's got legs. Um, so 
what's what's the point in sharing this journey? Well, I was at rock bottom. It's really hard to describe what it's like when your life, which you think is going in one direction, gets derailed. This wasn't the future that I had planned for myself. Um, you hear people, um, a turning point for me was when I went to a lecture at Excel. It's a very big um, events venue in the UK. There were something like 3000 people in the audience and a speaker got up and he was, um, he's the owner of a very successful software company. Some of you might have heard, but I'm not going to say the name, but he was telling us about his struggle. And from what I remember, there was a group of them and he was saying it was so hard, it was so hard. Um, at one point it got so bad, I nearly missed a mortgage payment. And I sat there with no money, bankrupt, claiming benefits, relying on food banks and with nothing. And I thought, you have no idea, mate. You <laughs> have absolutely no idea. Um, but what did I learn when you're at the bottom? Don't be afraid to ask for help. OK, you don't know what you don't know. Now, at my worst point, I was entitled to benefits, but I'd never claimed benefits before. And I was ashamed. I've been brought up. You don't claim benefits. That's what um, those people are scroungers. So in my head, I can't claim benefits. And then when I really realized I really needed them, I didn't know how to because I didn't know the system and I didn't ask anyone because I can do it myself. I'm an island. So ladies, we tend to take on everything, don't we? So ask for help. Um, I told you I went to food banks. I should have gone to food banks earlier. Why didn't I? Because I was ashamed. And shame can be a terrible thing. And actually, most people are decent. So if you don't know how to do something, if you don't know which way to turn, if you don't know which direction is the direction for you, I'm telling you, ask for help. And something else that's really important is if you're struggling, get company. Um, one of the things that happened to me was five years ago, my husband died. Uh, literally, in fact, it was um, Tuesday, the anniversary, the fifth anniversary of his death. So I didn't have that major person in my life to talk things through with. And it was around this time my friend said, come to church. And I'll tell you what church did for me. First of all, it gave me a safe and quiet space to just process it and start to heal. I think for a year I just went to church and cried. And then church became friends. Family, an extended family. I'm an only child. My mum lives miles away. My friends don't live close. And at my most broke, I couldn't afford the fuel in the car to travel and see them. So I was very lonely. And then finally, what church gave me was faith, hope for the future. So I wouldn't have gone by myself, but someone invited me. So what's my point here? My point is be kind always. Even if you're at rock bottom, the ability to be kind to people, the ability to help people, to share a smile, a kind word, a helping hand is absolutely massive because you truly don't know what they're going through. And I know that for me, even though this has been a horrible experience, and my goodness, it was awful. It was it was horrible. I'm not going to wrap it up and pretend it was anything different. Um, but having come out the other side, I genuinely think I'm a better person. I'm more sympathetic, more empathetic, more patient, kinder. And I, I believe I'm more prepared to help people. So my message is really, if you're in a dreadful, dreadful place at the moment, you will get out of it. You truly will. Um, if I could do it, absolutely anyone can. So thank you. You took me by surprise there. <laughs> but you're early. <laughs> thank you, Janet. Oh, thank you. Oh, you know, the things that you shared. Thank you for your vulnerability. Um, yeah. And as Ava started off, every day is a, a school day, learning and growing. Oh, 
Thank you, Janet. You're so welcome. And your children are beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I keep telling them they've won the genetic uh, jackpot. I don't know if you believe me. <laughs> oh, my word. So, well, we've heard from all our speakers, and I am going to give the opportunity to, and a big thank you from the bottom of my heart to our speakers. Um, thank you for sharing your passion and your heart with us. And I'm going to hand it over to Ritu um, to say a few words or to share as we have time. So, Ritu, over to you. Thank you so much, Karen. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Beautiful um, shares tonight as well. Amazing, really. And it resonates, I'm sure, with many of us, whatever has been shared. And Ava very truly started off uh, with how all of us have our share of hardships. And Janet very beautifully wrapped it all up after Doreen has shared what she shared, that no matter where you're at, it is going to get better. It is going to be okay. So keep going, carry on, don't give up. And we were having a little chat before everybody else came on and we started. And Doreen was um, telling us that hypnotherapy helps if anybody's been through trauma. The subconscious mind kind of and hypnotherapy may help. Um, what I have come to understand is that in this world, the, the five senses, three-dimensional, Darina, I love that expression. I'm going to use it from now on. The three-dimensional, five senses, uh, existence of human beings. What we used to do is we actually, used to put it in... Actually, it should, should be three-dimension, three five-sense bullshit that everybody <laughs> said. <laughs> oh, okay so brilliant brilliant <laughs> so so with with our existence what we also learn as we grow older is that we've got to have a brave face we've, we've got to show up smiling and all like nicely polished up our mess should be hi hidden away and even when we genuinely are organized when we've healed a bit moved forward from our hardships uh we're not allowed to show uh, the, the mess that is in the background because there is always a mess there is always mess at some level or the other big or small or very tiny or micro whatever but there is always some mess and many of us continue to live in denial many of us are brave enough to face what we have to face many of us make peace with it many of us try and befriend it and you know, absorb all the lessons and learnings from it because that is the reason in the first place we bumped into these experiences. But even then, on the forefront, all of us want to look all smiley, all happy, all polished. Everything's great in my life. This trauma thing, this, you know, uh, mess, whatever it is, it's for the next person. It's not for me. You know, I'm fine. I'm great. I think we need to bring that mess out. We need to make it visible because when we don't do that, we are giving energy to the mess itself because we are, we, we are protecting it. We are giving it a nicer face than it actually is. And the message that goes out is that if someone shows their mess to other people, then they should be ashamed of themselves. Whereas the reality is totally different. Anyone who's got the, the courage to Stand up and say, this is me. I'm a mess. I'm a beautiful mess, though. You know, I'm dealing with it. I'm treating it. I'm holding on to it. Whatever it is that I've decided to do, Janet. I, I am, I'm, this is me, right? The good, the bad, the ugly, the whole lot, right? I have healed, but I'm not there yet. Even if I'm there yet, there's another something there to be got to do. And I'm working on getting there. And Andrina very, very beautifully said actually before we actually started this we were having a little chat and she said there is always something there is always something that you need to address to deal with and that is so true there is always the, the beauty of this three-dimensional five senses existence is that we need to be working towards a better me every single day of our life we can never say this is it this is me i'm done I wish there was this time. And there are moments when we feel like that, but they're just their glimpse for us to feel proud of how far we have come, 
but that's not it. We've got to move forward. And I know why Carol has invited me to share this today, because uh, earlier today, during the day, I was at a full day conference uh, around domestic abuse and honor based um, abuse which was hosted by uh, a wonderful uh, charity organization uh, based in Birmingham called Roshni. And they house children and women who are fleeing domestic violence. And they have put up this conference where they invited leaders and professionals from this stream of work nationally. And they were all like high up people, police commissioners, um, you know, people high up in the other charities, things like that. And of course, they were talking about figures and facts and how funding is so scanty and everybody's running to make ends meet and charities and little organizations like ourselves are doing a great job of the little we can contribute towards the change, etc. And it was great. It was all going wonderfully well. Uh, and I was sat on one of the front tables, very visible, um, you know, from the stage and I could see the stage really well. Everything was wonderful the half of the day went by and I was chatting away telling people what I do very proudly and very happy about the whole thing um, then we come back from lunch and the first thing they have after lunch is a dance drama performance and that is around honor-based abuse and forced marriage now I wasn't forced into a marriage but I've experienced honor-based abuse as well as domestic abuse at quite a level and for prolonged periods of time. So much so that I was held hostage in my parents' house for eight, nine months altogether. Uh, and I was 23 or 24 years of age. Uh, and all for all these nine months, I was not allowed to speak to anyone. I was not allowed or, to receive or make phone calls. Uh, nobody was allowed to come and see me or speak to me. And I was certainly not allowed to get out of the house or speak to anyone or anything. And not just that I, so I was isolated from the outer world, nobody in the house um, spoke to me either. So I was there, but I was totally isolated on my own and nobody used to talk to me um, or even give attention as if uh, eye contact or say a word, good morning or good night or none of that. So that was, um, that was honor based abuse because what was happening was they wanted me to marry somebody of their choice and I did not agree to that. And I wanted to marry somebody of my choice and they did not agree to that. So they were trying to break my spirit by being like this. And I did not realize, of course, at the time that this was abuse, one, because nobody had educated us around that. Um, in, in communities like mine, uh, this is something normal and girls are supposed to listen to their fathers no matter what so whatever verdict was said that was it that goes I mean my father was a lovely person he was a very person he was a man of faith and he he was a community person very hard working self-made millionaire he was wonderful person person but he was culturally set in his ways and that was all he knew and that was all he implemented when he faced a challenge in the form of his youngest daughter, i.e. myself. So I was kept like that for nine months, but I did not know that was honor-based abuse. And I talk about this elaborately uh, and proudly that I have survived this. I've lived through these moments. And I've also written very elaborately about this experience in my book, which is going to be relaunched hopefully, God willing, this year. Uh, it's called Rich Man's Rich Daughter. And I have talked about it. I've talked about it very openly. Because the thing is, when we go through these hardships, the mess, we don't tend to expose it to everybody. And then when we do that, we are protecting the, the long-lasting traditions that have been going on and on and on for centuries over centuries. And we are still holding on to them. Unless somebody breaks this cycle and says, no, this is not how you work it. We're not doing things right. And that can only be done through education. Now, mind it, my, both my parents were educated people. My mom was a teacher and my dad was educated as well. And a big businessman, very respected person in the community. But that education did not reflect onto this um, situation. So they did what they did, what they knew best. So unless we educate and speak up 
and shout out and challenge and question. Avos talked about questions. Darina talked about questions, my favorite thing to do. Unless we ask questions, how are we going to find the answers? Unless I ask, why is it like this? Why are we continuing to do, why do we continue to do this? You know, there are better ways of doing it, or there are nicer, kinder ways of doing it. Why don't we switch to that? So questions are absolutely beautiful. Breaking cycles is absolutely wonderful. And going through hardships and talking about it is the most in thing, according to me. And I'm such a big advocate of sharing stories, shouting out about what you've gone through. There's no shame. This is the laurel we, we earn as a result of what we've been through. And as women, and I am biased, um, I, I don't apologize for it. <laughs> I am biased, but that comes down to my personal experience as well as the observations I have made. I mean, in a room full of like 200 people today, I think I'd be 100% correct if I said 90% of these people were women. So these are all charities and NGOs and you know advocates of uh, rights of equality and whatnot, and they were all women. There were only like very small number of men in there. There's a reason for that. And many speakers picked on that, which is commendable, which is great. But then, especially for women, we need to speak up when things don't go the correct way and we can see it, we can feel it, we can sense it. According to the three-dimensional five sense existence that we hold, whatever we can sense, whatever we can see, feel here, we need to speak that out and we need to speak our truth. That is so important. And that is our truth. That is what is your truth is your truth. Nobody has the right to say this did not happen or this is not how you should have felt. That's nobody's place to say. So what I want to say is, I mean, today's um, speeches or everything that was covered, I think that was absolutely wonderful and as if really placed together for me to listen to more than anything else tonight after what I went through. So, so sorry, I, I lost track and I was actually saying what happened when the dance drama came on. So the dance drama came on and uh, today after lunch break, dance drama performance came on and it was around honor-based abuse. And the first dialogue that they speak through the dancing is, uh, it's a man who's, who's saying it to his girl, you stupid little girl, what, who do you think you are bringing shame to the family? And that was it. And when I heard these words, something stirred up with, within me and I just could not control myself. I burst out crying and I left the room. And for the whole performance, which lasted about 25 minutes, I sat outside the room trying to garage, gather courage and you know get myself together so that I can pick myself up and go back to the room. But I could not gather courage to step back into the room while these things were still going on. So I sat outside and I could hear some stuff coming from the room because it was loud and I tried not to listen. But I was surprised. I was truly surprised after all these years, about 10 years now, having left my uh, mar first marriage, moved on, started doing work on myself um, and building myself as well as whatever little I can put out there for the community, for the women I meet and see. Um, I thought I was healed and I was done. And this was it. But this is never going to be it, possibly, probably. And I'm OK with that. But I'm going to continue to do whatever I can do to get to my best version of Five Senses 3D existence. Darina, I love you. Thank you so much. But thank you so much for listening, everyone. Um, Carol, thank you. I really appreciate you giving me time today. Please take it back. Thank you so much. amazing <laughs> you know I always say what's meant to be is what's meant to be and who was here tonight are the ones who are meant to be here um so I thank you for sharing that um had our fourth speaker turned up we wouldn't have had the opportunity for you to share the length that you did and I'm really grateful um yeah you're incredible you've been through a lot and thank you, your thank you. heart for wanting to actually start a charity along those lines which she is actually she's in the throes of finding so yes amazing well what an evening eh 
and I hope that everybody's had value from each other's uh, talk, story, journey, experience, expertise. I've learned a lot. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Mandy, for joining us from Manchester. Um, Darina from Palm Beach. Naresh from Warsaw. Yay. <laughs> Janet um, from Hertfordshire. Uh, Ava from London. And Ritu Local, <laughs> as well as myself. So it's been a fabulous evening. Um, are there any questions? Mustn't forget the Q&A, which I almost did. <laughs> so the floor is open for questions. Ask of each other. This is your moment. As I always used to say when I was a professor and the 200 students would be sitting there like we are, I would say, don't all speak at once. <laughs> and then yeah. somebody would raise their hand. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, Naresh. Hello, everyone. I think all the speakers were so brilliant this evening. I really enjoyed it and really took a lot in today. Thank you so much, everyone, each one of you. And it, it was quite emotional listening to the stories as well. And uh, each one of us have been through a lot of things which we do hide, like Rita said. On the surface, we, you know, we don't show it, but inside, we all sort of like hide something, don't we, really? But it's really right. It's really brought me out to talk now, which I really can't talk about my conditions at the moment. But the more I listen to these sort of talks and all the speakers have been really brilliant tonight. It really touched my heart. Thank you. Thank you. One day, Naresh, you will be able to. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Can, can I just come back on that as well, Naresh? Um, I... I kept mentioning in my story that I was ashamed. It probably took me um, about three years after it happened before I started to tell people. And I think I was afraid of judgment. And actually, 100% of people were just so supportive. So when the time is right, um, and you, you can do it in baby steps, you haven't got to tell everyone everything. Uh, but when you feel right, I am so certain that you will find love and support around you. And that'll give you the courage to share what you need to. I don't know if anyone else agrees. Absolutely, 100%. I think you always meet the right people in your life, don't you? Definitely. You know. Well, I don't know if I said that right. Do you? <laughs> yeah. You know, when you've had problems and you don't know who to share it with, you always seem to meet the right person standing there for you. Even if the people you meet don't turn up to be the best people you could have met, Naresh, these are the mm. people who should have come to you for one reason or the other. So you know how they say when you meet someone, they're either a blessing or a lesson. I'd say they're always a blessing because a lesson yeah. is a blessing as well, really. You learn yeah. something out of whatever experience you've had. So totally bang on. I mean, whoever you meet is in the right time for you to meet. Mm. Mm. Thank you. And I was so happy to meet you and Carol. Yeah. That's Both mutual, today. likewise, Naresh. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. Both of you are so lovely, honestly. <laughs> I have a question for Ava. Ava, I'm from the you that you do a lot of writing. Could you repeat that, Ritu? Missed it. Sorry, I think oh. my, my connection may not be Yeah, well, you froze be the best. What I'm saying is, uh, from um, Ava's introduction, we found out that she's done quite a bit of writing. So I'd like to know what, what kind of writing you've done, what, what type of books have you written? Can't hear you, Ava. No, you're not on mute. Try again, try again. 
How do you? Jump out and jump in again if it doesn't work. Zoom is being itself again. That's right. Last night, one of our ladies, she could not unmute herself. But the funny thing with that, Ritu, although I showed I was not muted, I couldn't speak. You couldn't hear me. I was speaking no. and you couldn't hear me and I couldn't get my camera off either. We couldn't I see couldn't you. We video. couldn't hear you yesterday. It was all like you there. That's all I could see. Yeah. We couldn't hear you at all either. It was strange. It was quite strange. Mm. Oh. How hot is it in Palm Beach right now, Dorina? I don't know. Let me let me check my phone. <laughs> You've got the air con going. <laughs> oh, my God. It's 92 Fahrenheit. Jeez. Whoa. That's unusually hot here. It's normally in the upper 80s. Goodness. Yep. Hey, here comes Ava. Let's hope her audio is working now. Well, I'm surprised my Zoom didn't act up famous last words. If I fall off, that's why. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> well, she's trying to connect to audio. Well, while we're waiting for Ava, one thing mm -hmm. I wanted to say was is that I do have a couple of papers that prove that time does not exist in an absolute sense. It oh. is a creation of the observer. The first is on decoherence and quantum gravity. Very, very interesting. You don't want to try to read them because unless you're a high level mathematician, all yeah. you're going to see is stuff that looks like squiggles in Greek letters. <laughs> so what would you suggest? somebody reads to understand if they're not a mathematician actually there is there is a series of books that addresses part of the issue the issue of consciousness creating reality mm -hmm. by a gentleman no relation named richard lanza okay. md not rich not richard lanza phd at mit this is another Lanza from Boston, Richard Lanza, comma, MD. And uh, he, he has adopted the word biocentrism okay. to describe that. But it only deals with that component of consciousness creating, the, uh, creating what we're, you know, the solidity, solidity. By the way, you can't walk through walls because of electromagnetic resistance. Our density is too close to the wall, but ghosts can go through walls just fine. <laughs> because they have different density. Yes, I forgot to tell you that. But anyway, yeah, if somebody that's, wants, if you want to- That's very interesting. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. If you want to hear more, uh, ping me on, on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, Ava's back. Oh, Ava's still connecting. Yeah, yes. Well, she came in. Couldn't it connect audio, so she's jumped yeah. out and jumped back in again. Gremlins, technological gremlins. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, Ava? Has she? No, she's still not. No, she's connecting to audio, it says. Yeah. Mm. Janet, how long were you married for? Um, yeah, well, it, it would have been our 25th wedding anniversary last year, so oh. quite a while. Um, yeah, it's, it's tough, but I mean, it, it does get better after five years, but he, he was a big personality. He, he was um, actually an incredible man. So, yeah, very blessed to have been together. And, you know, I feel sad for him as well that it went wrong. I think sometimes it, it hits men a bit harder when like their life's work, understandably, when their life's work yeah it's upside down um 
but it was I absolutely loved working with my husband because it it meant that we got to spend you know we lived together we traveled together we worked together um and it was just brilliant <laughs> but I wouldn't have been a sales trainer now if, if you know if my life hadn't changed direction I do love what I do because I help people mm-hmm. so yeah it's so cool oh Ava's now with us with audio hey Ava Oh, she's gone again. Yeah. Sorry, shall I stop the recording, Carol? And then we'll wait for her when she comes in. Yeah. Should we do that? Yeah, good yeah. idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are you going to pause I it? know. While we're waiting for her, I'll get the biocentrism books and hold them up so you can see them. I will be <laughs> oh. uh, Sorry, ladies. I have to go now. Carol, read the all the...